Welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. I'm your host, Ben Plumley, and this is a podcast about global health and human rights. We're brought to you in partnership with the Bay Area Global Health Alliance, a network of academic institutions, biotech and tech, other companies, NGOs and community organizations, all based in the Bay Area and all committed to improving the health of people around the world. You can find more about the Alliance at www.bayareaglobalhealth.org. Well, in this episode, we catch up with Tom Peters, the internationally respected writer on business management practices. He is, if you like, the management guru's guru. His book, In Search of Excellence, co-authored with Robert Waterman, has influenced generations of leaders, including me, in private, public and non-profit sectors, And he has made popular the idea that all forms of leadership and success are rooted in the commitment and uplifting of people, whether it's employees, customers or society as a whole. Last year, Tom launched a new campaign, Excellence Now, to channel his expertise to address the challenges of these extraordinary current conditions. And as part of this, he's published a new book, Extreme Humanism, which I strongly recommend. And it's got quotes, references and pearls of wisdom, which will make you rethink how collectively and individually we manage our way out of the mess we find ourselves in. Tom, welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. Thank you. I am A, delighted to be here, and B, more significantly, I am delighted about your topic area. I have actually, over the years, devoted a fair amount of time to healthcare, albeit in a slightly different dimension. My fanaticism, uh, and it was more local than global, was patient safety. And patient safety in the United States is far worse than a criminal act. You know, we kill 200 or 300,000 people a year, fundamentally because people don't wash their damned hands. And that's become a central component of what we've been going through this last year, right? So I- extreme humanism, i it's not a call for fundamentalist atheism, is it? Could you talk a bit about it and what your broader campaign is about? Yeah, but l- let me, yes. I think, particularly since healthcare is your general area, that I have a perfect illustration. Uh, I tripped and fell a couple of weeks ago and everything was fine, but the doctor was being extra careful, which is fine. And so I had to have uh, a brain CAT scan. Uh, So let's talk about those things. The brain CAT scan, brain, brain CAT scan is uh, delivered by techs in a room. Mm. And at some subsequent point, afternoon, evening, who knows, the radiologist looks at my results, right? Okay. And this is experimental evidence. Two states of nature. The radiologist is looking at a screen and it is filled with ones and zeros and data, right? That's state one, the normal state. State two is the same thing, except there is a little teeny photograph of me in the upper right-hand corner of the radiologist screen. If there is a little photo of me, which probably is three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch, the radiologist spends roughly twice as many times and finds roughly twice as many complications. That is longer and better. There was one test that was done that I liked even more. Uh, Radiologists look at me and a hundred other people and they discover some anomalies, all right? Mm. They discover I don't know what the real numbers are, but let's say they are looking at their screen without me. And let's say they find 20 anomalies, all right? And you, Ben, are one of the radiologists. As part of the experiment, 
three months pass. And at the end of three months, they look at the same data on me that they had looked at before with a little photo of me in the corner. The number of anomalies that they find when, when the photo of me is not there goes down by 80%. They found 20 anomalies when Tom was in the upper left-hand corner, and they found four anomalies when they were looking at a blank screen with data. I mean, if, if you want extreme humanism, that's the best way on earth I've ever found to explain it. One little bloody square picture on the corner and the person involved is analyzing data show, so he literally can't see it in some sense, except this vague thing, which is a human being. And what do you put that down to? Is that... Uh, that they see, uh, frankly, an older white man who probably has really good health insurance, or is it just that connection with a human face that gets them to think? Connection because this was done on a large sample, and I did not do the deep research, but there was no evidence whatsoever that there was any variation depending upon race, age, or what have you. Uh, yeah, you got the old white guy in my, I mean, maybe, you know, I will bet you this. I bet you that the primary conclusion stays the same in terms of percentage of improvement. All right. But I do bet you, I'm sorry to say that there will be variation around that as a function of maybe age and frighteningly, probably, almost surely, race. It's, but yeah, your, your question is, a, is, a, is an awful question, meaning it's a wonderful question, meaning whatever word I should use. Well, in, I mean, in extreme humanism, and I want to come back to this, you, you do talk about uh, this time of reckoning um, for the climate, uh, for the way uh, society lifts up women and people of color. But I'd really like to start, if it's okay with you, just, you know, you've, you've had an extraordinary life. Uh, the U.S. Navy in Vietnam, you were a consultant for McKinsey. And I, separately, by the way, was, um, it was extraordinary the way you criticized the company deeply for its role in the opioid crisis. You've been an independent writer. What do you think are the key lessons that could help us prepare for life in this new age of pandemics? In my case, the new messages are the old messages. Literally, starting with In Search of Excellence, language was different. We said, put people first. Uh, and I have written 19 books. I said to somebody, I think it was on Twitter or something like that, I'm greedy like anybody else. I would dearly love to have the royalties from you reading each of my 19 books, but the real reality is they all say the same thing, so pick any one. Uh, it's not quite true because, because of COVID, this book is different. I say people first, but I'm talking a lot more about people first, community first, racial equality, many more women in senior slots and climate change. Uh, maybe it's just age, but or age plus the pandemic. But I mean, I was again doing something on Twitter and somebody made a comment, and I think this takes us right back to the little photo in the corner. And, and he said, people are our number one asset. And I screamed at him in print. I said, somebody is writing you a comment on Twitter, and that person's name is not Asset Peters. It is Tom Peters. And, you know, semantic differences, yeah, but semantics are pretty much all we've got mm. at some level. It's like I have a whole section in the new book on I will never speak to you again if you utter the words human resource. 
Uh, I am not a human resource. I am Thomas Jacob Peters, born on November the 7th, 1942, during an air raid warning in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, so that I'm getting not noisier, but I'm getting, I'm, I'm focusing more. I, I haven't, and the other piece of that, and I'm, I'm angry at myself. I, I haven't quite said the same thing 19 times in a row. I've implied it, but I have not emphasized the moral dimension enough. I have not mentioned in the emphasized in equality enough. I have not emphasized the fact that the organization is a community. And, and let me just give you a little example again of, of what I mean. Uh, we'll put you in a sizable organization. And thanks to the pandemic, you're at home. The folks who work for you, your boss, the 15 or 20 people who work for you are at home. Uh, and whether you're doing too many or too few is irrelevant. You're having a lot of Zoom meetings, okay? Uh, and one of the people in your group, Marjorie, you have about four a week. And one of the people in your group, Marjorie, let's, let's make it a man. Let's make it a Tom. Tom has been on time for every meeting and not missed a meeting. Now, you are going to sit down with me and say, Tom, we're going to have a little mini evaluation. And you get a lower grade than you would expect because your attendance record has been perfect. We are in the middle of a pandemic. I know from our personal conversations that you have a mother with early onset Al Alzheimer's. I know that you've got two kids at home. I know that your wife is teaching school on the second floor of the house. Please, Tom, pay attention to what you need to pay attention to. I don't need perfect attendance. If something comes up and you miss four meetings in a row, please, please, please do it. Uh, and, and, that, and, and what I'm arguing in the book as well is that that sort of humanness, there's no reason whatsoever that it should not carry over pretty much in full uh, when we get past this. And, and then another specific point, because you are in the valley. Uh, I don't, and this is not about my age, I don't know what the hell AI is going to do to the world 30 years from now or 20 years from now. But a funny thing is true, even if you're a 42 year old. To get to, 20, to, get to 40, 2041, first you got to get through 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, and I will guarantee you that in the next, I mean, it's like, it's like uh, the self-driving cars. They're absolutely fabulous. The software is there. But by the time Sunnyvale and Cupertino and Palo Alto and South Dartmouth, Massachusetts, uh, make their own local regulations, ain't going to happen. And so tech may be there, but it's going to take years upon years upon years. And I think 10 or 15 or and maybe we'll get it on the interstates, but in, we will not get it in South Dartmouth. Anyway, uh, so my bias is that, you know, there is a distinction that that is made. Uh, and it is sometimes called AI versus IA. AI, artificial intelligence, toss the bodies out the door. IA, intelligence augmented, make Ben and Tom better at what they're doing because of AI. IA, because of artificial intelligence, sorry. Uh, and then to top that off, um, as thinking of where, you know, you're talking about the Valley, I was a resident of the Valley for 30 years. Uh, I did work in the early day. I, I did the most amazing thing in the history of the world, people say sometimes. I wrote my book in 1980 on an, on an Apple II computer, which was radicalism of the, of the first sort. Uh, I worked from time to time with Steve Jobs. So I'm pretty conversant with Apple or ye olde Apple. But what I loved was their very famous uh, top designer, Johnny Ive, uh, at one point was quoted, and I won't get the quote exactly right, but he said something like, I know it's arrogant, but as we do our work, we have a goal of maybe just maybe making humanity a little bit better. 
And frankly, I don't think there should be any product or any service, uh, including internal services like a training department, where that's not the aim. And I think, and I'm going to be careful with my words here because I'm going to say something and then tell you I didn't mean it. I think that is the best defense against AI. But I hate the word defense, so I will say it is the best offense relative to AI. And, you know, as I said, I don't know what the hell happens in 30 years from now. You know, we will have universal basic income. Nobody will be going to work and machines will take care of everything. I don't know whether the hell that's going to be the case or not. And neither do you. And neither that's does that's very oh, Isaac oh. Asimov. Um, you know, I really, uh, your differentiation between AI and IA really had a big impact on me because it's about how we embrace technologies. And and that's a, a thing that's really been at the heart of this podcast. Um, I look at them, particularly in biomedical terms, um, you know, biopharmaceuticals and biotech. But um, the same thing applies really to every aspect of, of, uh, of human existence. In your book, you talk about um, seeing good design, engaging design in pretty much everything, including financial papers, um, you know, uh, quarterly budgets. And, and, and I've got to say, having led a, uh, a non-profit for nearly a decade where – and, and I've got to say, I'm, I am really not very good at reading numbers. But one of the things that um, I would say almost was an, an – an, uh, an act of beauty was when our chief financial officer finally got a short set of power, a short PowerPoint together that really described the state of the finances and described the way forward in a way that was thoroughly understandable. And I, I remember saying to her at the time, I thought that was a work of beauty and she thought I was completely mad. But I loved the way you, 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 you describe um, extreme humanism to every aspect of our, of well, our your, engagement. Your point is brilliant on another dimension. I worked for seven years for McKinsey, not that McKinsey that I wrote about in the Financial Times two weeks ago, which was enabling OxyContin overdoses. But I worked for, I hope and think, a better McKinsey. Uh, in New York, and it's the fact that I can remember his name 40 years later is, is in itself tells you something, 50 years later. In New York, there was a guy by the name of Gene Zelazny. And Gene was the guy who taught us, to, taught us how to do slides, uh, full-time job. And it was precisely what you said about that financial report. He wanted them to be clear, it wasn't doing, and this is true of design. Design isn't about cutesy stuff. You know, it wasn't that we had a smiling person at the top of the spreadsheet, but it was clear, it was simple, it was straightforward. He said, sometimes you use, and this sounds counter, you know, counterintuitive, he said, sometimes you should use six slides instead of one so that you can show each relationship and not just try to jam all the damn stuff together. I mean, I'm completely on your side. I, I had, I think it was the economist uh, editor in chief at a program of mine. And I said, I love your magazine. I've known a lot of people who edited your magazine, but you guys truly suck at graphical representation. Everything you do is four times more complicated than it needs to be. And, I, and, and when I say that, I'm saying that as a person with four quantitative degrees. Unlike you in that regard, two in engineering, two in business, and in terms of the numbers, everything pretty much always works for me. And I'm still saying the same damn thing. Uh, you know, and, 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 it, and it is beauty. You know, I mean, another example I gave in the book, and, and I realize this isn't, you know, your main audience, is I said, Beauty applies as much to someone who has a six-person appliance repair shop in South Dartmouth, where I live. And beauty is partially beauty, which starts with a clean truck uh, and, you know, overalls that 
look like they've seen the washing machine within the last few days. Uh, absolutely positively arriving on time. Um, and, and, and and that's design, in my opinion. It's the, it's not that you're be better than somebody else at fixing the appliance. You're pretty damn good or you wouldn't be there and a friend of mine wouldn't have recommended it to you. Uh, but it's the whole presentation of, and, and that's part of your solving my problem. I feel better about you and the problem because you really demonstrate some, some people call it professionalism. I choose to call it design. Hmm. Could we talk a bit about um, healthcare and what you've, you know, what you've seen over your career and what you're seeing now? It it seems to me that the approaches that we've used in the United States to plan and deliver healthcare, it, in many ways, are at odds with the values you hold dear, and 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 many of those approaches left us unprepared to deal with deadly pathogens that don't respect national or state lines or business deals or commercial ventures. What do you think we in the States could have done differently? One piece of it, and obviously, as you know better than I, there are a hundred answers. To the, no, there are a thousand answers to the question. Uh, one, you will notice I have not held up my book so that you can look at the type, pretty picture. And the reason I say that is because I do hold up books during these presentations, and it is a book, single book, and it is called Compassionomics. Compassionomics is written by two MD researchers. This is called Compassionomics, colon, the revolutionary scientific evidence that caring makes a difference. It is the worst title in the world, which makes it a perfect title. Let me give you another example, and it's a carbon copy in a way, the little photo in the upper right-hand corner. And they, I mean, these guys are, excuse the language, hard-ass researchers. This is not a lovey-dovey book. They are MDs, they have PhDs. The mathematics in these books, you couldn't understand, and I, the quant, can barely understand it. So this is, this is not cute anecdotes. Uh, at some point during the book, they introduce us to the magic number 37. And this came out of a bunch of studies. And I believe this is pandemic related. I think you'll agree. And if you don't, certainly say so. If you, the doctor, are delivering to me a pretty bad news message, uh, unexpected cancerous blob showed up, you know, after having had those x-rays or, you know, uh, whatever it happened to be. If you look me in the eye for 37 seconds, my complications will go through the floor. My hospitalization will go down by something like 35%. That's insane. Mm. And it is just that little little human touch. There was a there was a um, horrible article in the Boston Globe, uh, MGH Massachusetts General Hospital, which happens to be my hospital, hangs in there with you know any any anybody in the world, and one piece of evidence said that nurses are all now carrying tablets, and when they are at the bedside. They don't look at me, they look at the damn tablet, not because they want to, but because of the data entry requirements. Uh, the measurement was that patient nurse contact has gone down, eye contact, sorry, specifically, patient nurse eye contact has gone down by 70% since the tablets were introduced. Mm -hmm. And again, back to the compassionomics method message, you know, that's, that's the essence of the healing process. A healing is not that you walked in there with an IQ of 872. It is that you treat your patients but like human beings. I mean, here's one of my favorite examples in the world. Uh, almost every darn list that you can imagine in the world of American healthcare has got Mayo Clinic at the top. Yeah. Uh, and if it's not in the top, it sure as hell is in the top five. Uh, so you, Ben, are applying for a hot shit surgeon's job at Mayo. 
with a fabulous record behind you, incredible record behind you, and I'm your Mayo interviewer. Uh, what you don't know is as you and I talk, you know, I'm going to say scratching on my hand with a pen, but whatever. When you and I talk, I'm keeping an accurate count, one, two, three, four, count of the number of times that you use the word we and the number of times that you use the word I in describing your experiences. And in a very quantitative way, if the I's beat the D, the we's, dude, you ain't getting the job. The net, you know, and, and it's really, it's a whole, it's, there's a wonderful book that I hope all your healthcare people who haven't read it read. It's called, and I don't remember the author's names, they're great people I know, Management Lessons from the Mayo Clinic. Mr. May, Dr. Mayo himself in 1914 introduced the idea of team medicine, hmm. and it never took. And there's one, and obviously she's exaggerating, but there is a, uh, a, a, a senior medical staffer in a Mayo hospital, and it, you know, it's sloppy use of language in a way. And she said, she's not a youngster. She said, I am 100 times better at practicing medicine since I arrived at Mayo because we all support each other. And, you know, so, and that certainly is, is, is a pandemic issue. People want to be cared for. People want to be cared for. I mean, don't let me distract this by timeliness, but I'm more than a little bit irritated at what I read this morning um, about the percentage of health care frontline people who refuse to have vaccinations. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Don't get me going on that one. I was in the Navy for four years, and if anybody can use obscenity, it's me. And people who don't wear masks and people who don't get vaccinated deserve every obscenity that I learned as a sailor boy back in 1966. But let's not get started. On and, that I, one. and I bet those could be a, um, a bit rich, too. But but look, two two broader questions I wanted to get your thoughts on. And you're in the book, you're passionately committed uh, to the first is climate change. And the, the second is equality for women and people of color. And I, we mentioned it at the start. You referred to this being a reckoning coming. What do you think we need to be doing? What What is happening here? Well, I'm going to have to divide your question into the three pieces that you de facto divided it into. Uh, for reasons that are, you know, too lengthy to go into at this time. I've been focused on the women's issue since 1996. So this is a quarter century. And I've said, and this is really important, I believe in social justice. Fine, good for you, Tom. You're just a lovely human being. The reason to put women in charge is because they're better at doing this stuff than the boys are. I've got it in this book. I had it in my last book. There are a, enough serious studies to sink a ship that say, on average, women are better leaders. On average. I really use the word on average uh, religiously and by raising my voice. There are shitty women bosses and there are fabulous men bosses. But on average, women are better leaders, better negotiators, better salespeople and better investors. I think my, my favorite book title in many a year, there's a woman by the name of Lou Ann Lofton, who's a senior person at, at, uh, at, at The Motley Fool. And she wrote a book that has such a great title. Warren Buffett invests like a girl colon and why you should too and you know i can't go into all the reasons but it's again it's serious stuff with a lot of data uh so social justice is and i'm separating this from race mm. social justice is a great reason to do it but as i say to people when i'm in an audience with a bunch of men i said i don't give a damn and i'm not serious i don't give a damn what your social justice score is 
if you want a better business that serves customers better, serves your employees better, and makes more money, make sure that women are in charge to a dramatic degree. And I'm saying in this book, if you don't have 50% 50 of women on your board of directors, I don't want to see you, I don't want to talk to you, but I am willing to publicly declare you to be an idiot. Yeah, we and we've still got such a bloody long way to go. Look, I, I realize, Tom, we're getting up to the top of the hour. But have we... I have to say something about no, the... No, go ahead. ...that does have to do with age. Yeah. I'm in... I don't know what you call it, depression, bad spirits beyond the pandemic. I was pretty heavily involved in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Uh, taught the first affirmative action course that was ever taught at the, a little school in Silicon Valley called Stanford, for example. Uh, and I grew up near Washington, D.C., which was the Deep South when I was a boy. So I know it when I see it in terms of awful discrimination. I stupidly thought that we'd kind of gotten the job done in the 60s. And I read a lot of history. Mm -hmm. And I, I am in such despair about my own stupidity relative to the degree of the costs of inequality in terms of the human condition, financial well-being, relative in particular to our African-American colleagues, and obviously looking as long back as the beginning of the week, our Asian-American colleagues. Uh, it's got to be on every agenda, every day, in every organization of every size. Um, and I will go the social justice route on this one. I want to see the numbers. There was, a, there was an ad that was in the New York Times. It was really an advertorial uh, written by an African-American who I think was the CEO of a, of a big, biggish consulting company. And this was in his print thing. He said, dear corporate America, dear senior executives, I really, really, really appreciate the degree to which you have been supporting loudly in advertising BLM, Black Lives Matter. Mm. But he said, Ben, Dr. Ben, CEO Ben, would you please send me a picture of your executive team, a photo of your executive team? Uh, great to support BLM, but when I look at that lily white, I'll say mainly male, but we're not talking male now, lily white executive team, or tokenishly non Lily White, you're not serious. Uh, and, and I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm sad. I'm mad at myself. I'm furious at myself. I thought the job was mainly done when when Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, and that makes me one of the twentieth or maybe twenty million stupidest people on earth. I mean, we've got. What's clear, uh, and, and these things have come together, climate change, the, uh, the violence against, a, against Asian Americans, the Black Lives Matter movement, police violence against minorities, is that we've got a lot, a lot of work to do. And, and I think what is so, so nice about extreme humanism is the way you pull the lessons of your life and the advice that you've given leaders over the years to sort of provide a foundation for us to 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 take us to this next stage as we enter this new this new generation. So so one last question for you. Uh, I I know your time is limited, but is there one thing that you would ask us, the viewers and listeners of a Shot in the Arm podcast, who are interested in global health and human rights? What's the one thing we should take away and, and really focus on now? Well, when the pandemic came along, my wife is an entrepreneur and a social activist, and she's also a tapestry weaver, which knows, means she knows how to use her fingers. And she was making masks 
and a lot of our neighbors were making masks. Uh, and one morning, I I think I said it to my colleague Shelley Dolly, who's who's listening to us right now. I said, my wife is busy making masks, and I'm sitting on my ass. Uh, and so I said, I'm going to be arrogant, Shelley, but let's solicit friends and not yet friends in the world of podcasts and tell them that Tom would love to talk with you for a half an hour about leadership in the age of COVID-19. And I did. And relative to your one piece of advice, uh, I came up with what I called the COVID-19 Leadership 7. And I really do hope that every business person or nonprofit person and the seven are be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be positive, be present, walk in the other person's shoes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, you know, I was raised a Presbyterian, but I haven't darkened many church doors, so I'm not giving a religious spiel. Uh, I would just so dearly love to see every leader of everything make that a strategic centerpiece. And the reality again, and I'm not trying to, to uh, dilute my own message, so it also turns out the best be the best way to have happy customers grow market share and watch your bank account grow. Uh, you know, I years ago I was giving a I graduated from Cornell in engineering and I was invited to come back and do a distinguished lecture. And I said to him at some point, my degree is in engineering, so I have to use equations. It's in my genes. And my equation is K equal sign R equal sign P. And the equation stands for kindness equals repeat business mm. equals profit. And I want to toss that equation aside because I think that what we're doing in the age of COVID-19 should be for human reasons, not for profit driven reasons. But that business performance, I mean, I just get so well, you know, we could talk forever when people but, say, you know, this, ul this ultimately, business, ultimately, Tom, this is what th this unites us in, in, in a sense, good business is, is good humanity is good, is good citizenship. Yeah. David Brooks nailed it too. And I had forgotten to mention this earlier. David Brooks, New York Times columnist, extraordinary human being. I think it was in a book he wrote, but he had it in a single column. And Brooks distinguished between what he called resume virtues and eulogy virtues. The resume says, graduated from a great college with a 4.7 grade point average, went to work for Deloitte and Touche was promoted five times in the first seven years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the accomplishments. The eulogy virtues, on the other hand, are what they say about you at your funeral. And at your funeral, they talk about, they don't talk about the wasn't he usually, they're not that crude. Was he a fabulous human being? Hmm. There was a uh, great, American columnist by the name of Tim Russert, and he was tough questioner, et cetera. And Peggy Noonan, the name that may, that may resonate with some people, wrote his obit uh, in the Wall Street Journal. And she said, Tim Russert, everybody who ever came in contact with him said he was an extraordinary human being who cared to an extraordinary degree. Uh, so 
one of the practical things I would say, or my last word or what have you, uh, to all of you uh, in healthcare and besides, at the end of the day, think to yourself, how's my eulogy score today? How's my eulogy score today? Uh, because despite the advances of modern medicine, uh, one of these days you ain't going to be around and uh, you are going to have somebody who recognizes you after you do pass away. And uh, I use a slide, a PowerPoint slide in my presentation to emphasize this. It's a tombstone. And on the tombstone, it says, Joe Smith, 23718642 dollars and seven cents. Net worth on the day he died at the time the market closed. Ain't never been a tombstone with net worth on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is he gonna do with it? Well well look, Tom, I I, I know we've reached the top of the hour. I, I just want to say what a fascinating, wide-ranging conversation this has been. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you are a shot in the arm, Tom Peters. Well, I have enjoyed this very much. And as our viewers don't realize, we fought some technical issues before we started, and that made it even more fun. There's, there's yeah, not we got through it. <laughs> um, well... Thanks to Tom. Thanks to News.media's Eric, Eric Espera, our producer and director. And thanks also to Sarah Anderson from the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. And of course, finally, thanks to you, our viewers and listeners. If you have any questions or comments about this or indeed any of our shows, don't hesitate to contact us through Facebook and Twitter at Shot Arm Podcast. We'd love it if you'd leave a review on Apple Podcasts and give us five stars. It helps get the word out. Have a great week and a safe week, everyone. Yeah.